on a fantastic Friday. My goodness, we're in what, the second week, almost the third week of June. My goodness, right around the corner from 4th of July. It's the Teddy Bear and welcome to Night Tracks Radio. Today's artist spotlight, gifted singers and songwriters, a super talented Valerie Day and Mr. John Smith. I call him Joe Cool. Lord have mercy. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> from the legendary right Grammy <laughs> from the legendary Grammy nominated group New Shoes is joining us today and I can't believe we are celebrating 45 years. Whew, time flies by. Teddy right? Bear had hair. <laughs> <laughs> we all had more hair. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for joining us today. And congratulations on 45 years in this crazy business we call music. Thank you. Yeah. And it's still going on. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. <laughs> you know, I want to talk about one of, to me personally, one of the, one of your most underrated songs, Drifting, wow. vocally incredible. Valerie, Aww. out of all the different songs that you have given yourself to, to me, that was an essential Valerie day. Just you just you put everything into it. And I wanted to ask both of you, what was the process going in the studio working on that particular single? Hmm. You mean working on the vocal? Yes. Or yes. And and there were two versions of it. So I, I don't know if you've heard both versions. No, but I haven't. Just just there, the one. There's one on New Shoes Orchestra too. Okay. That, okay. that we did in twenty oh seven. Yeah, but anyway. Yeah. Anyway, what do you have to say about that, Val? Well, I want to hear what you have to say first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it was a really good fit between the song and the singer, you know, and and the recording was really nice. Um, that song was pretty worked out uh, in the songwriting process. So I don't know. Um, I, I think it was a really nice record, though. And actually, we... Um, we did a mix that we rejected because it pounded too hard. It, and it mixes <laughs> in those days of the LA studios, you know, the top LA studios. Um, they it, we a mix would cost like like ten thousand five hundred dollars, and and we used to say that it was like driving a really nice used BMW into the sea. Wow. If you were if you rejected a mix, you know, you just drove a really nice used BMW into the sea. So there was an earlier version there that the drums were too poundy, you know. But that was a great. But people talk about songs writing themselves, and that one almost did. Yeah. Well, vocally and the arrangement was incredible. But you know what I want to do? I want to do something a little bit different. I'm going to make a left turn to Albuquerque, so to speak. Go on. <laughs> Go ahead on. I wanted to ask both of you, what is your philosophy on life, meaning your overall vision towards music and life in general at this stage in your career? Oh. <laughs> hmm. That's a big question, my dear. <laughs> That's a big question. Though... We kind of were talking earlier today, John and I, about how different life is compared to how we thought it would be at this stage of the game. I love I love being in my 60s because I think there's been enough of life that's gone by that I can see some of the patterns. Not that everything always has a pattern, but that, that makes it a little easier to know that well, first of all, when you're young, you just don't even know you, if you're going to live through it. And then you do. And then, mm -hmm. you pick, you know, there's success and failure. And you learn how to deal with both because both actually can be challenging and have important gifts within them, too. So um, earlier today, we were just talking about how miraculous it is that we get to be artists at this stage of our life without worrying too much about um, the, the output and what how it's received um we're not doing music uh in in the way that we thought we'd be we thought we would always play live we thought we would always record music we thought we would always be the people who we were um 20 years ago 
30 years ago, 40 years ago, 45 years ago, <laughs> it just keeps going on. And, and we're not, and we're not those people anymore. And sometimes, I don't know, I think probably a lot of your listeners too, if they're our age or even a little older or younger are maybe in a, a in a place in their lives where things that gave them pleasure, gave them joy, don't as much anymore, but there's new things that come on the horizon. So for instance, our, um, we don't do music live anymore, but John's busy learning how to play ragtime guitar and, and uh, a little Bach, you know, and um, he's doing all kinds of uh, art. He's got graphic, graphic novels in the works. And um, I get to do, I, my love is photography, but also helping people. So one of the things I've been doing is a, is an online course for singers called Becoming a Singer that talks about everything you have to do to step on the stage and live a vocal life, not just learning how to sing, but all the stuff that over my 20 years as a voice teacher, my students would bring to their lessons and say, oh my God, what do I do about the drummer? He's so loud. <laughs> You know, or whatever their problems were, it was like, okay, let's talk about, you know, your monitor and how to EQ it and, and how your voice works in your body and, you know, all the things. Anyway, it is it, just, I guess, at this stage of the game, I'm just grateful to be alive. I'm thankful every day for another opportunity to get a little better at being a person and um and actually relax into being who i am you know that was something that took a long time as well to get comfortable with i thought i always had to be you know it was a self-improvement project all along the way and i feel like finally maybe i don't need to do any more self-improving maybe i can just just enjoy and um and see the beauty in what is right in front of me in this moment Without question, John, being the savant that you are, do you feel okay. that? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, yeah, I'll go for that. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, we're going to accept that. Go ahead. <laughs> do you feel now at this stage of your life, as far as not having the, I guess, the restraints of being with a major record label and being an independent artist, having such a level of freedom has brought out more of the creative process for you and all the different endeavors that you are doing and enjoying at this time of your life? Well, you know, I, I always been mostly interested in the chess game of, of the way uh, certain note combinations make you feel a certain way. Like the psychology behind the, the chords are the psychology behind the melody. All right. So you produce different results with different, number combinations and i use that term as a catch-all for you know clusters of notes that do different things right and right. i'm still interested in that I, i'm still really interested in that and so i get to pursue all kinds of crazy uh back roads now because i'm not writing for one band and then i was in advertising for 20 years which was great until it wasn't it was the best hippie job in the world until until the business got a little meaner, leaner, and very much meaner, and um, uh, less ideas and less attention span from the world. Blah blah. blah. But I always have uh, really enjoyed being an arranger. That's what I set out to be—a music arranger. I was inspired by arrangers like Eddie Palmieri, especially. Um, you know, that could just make a big sound with a piece of music paper. Uh, that's the part I dig, and I'm still interested in that. So in in, uh, in between all the other things I'm doing, I, I have a whole series of graphic novels I did. I just wrote two st short story collections in the last year. And, you know, we have a philosophy around here that it's an art machine. You start it up, it goes. And and you know there's no um, there's no fear. There there I've never really had fear. I, I go out and dare to be bad. You know, <laughs> you want to write a good song, write a hundred bad ones. And I was really fortunate because when I hit Portland in 1975, I was barely musically literate, 
And but once I started arranging, everything I wrote out got played. I got to hear the mistakes and the successes, and it's still interesting to me. We it's call him the the mad scientist, of course. The mad <laughs> it's a happy birthday the man with the knife behind the curtain hey, you know what I, I love the creative aspect of putting like it's almost like uh putting a puzzle together oh and yeah. making every making everything match together like a clockwork you, yes absolutely absolutely you know one of the things i've always found interesting you guys have experienced so much together as a unit. And I, one of the things that I did not get an opportunity to speak to you about the last time, I want to touch upon mental health because you have a lot of artists who have suffered from that and it's been a detriment to their career. And I wanted to ask, how have you both collectively been able to maintain and have a balance, maintain a balance in both of your lives where you are there and very supportive of one another. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's, there's been rough patches in in the road of being in a band together for however many years, and um, but we, you know, we genuinely like each other, and we genuinely have <laughs> our our areas that we fill in terms of of being in a group. You know, I've always been responsible for the writing and. Valerie's all, always been responsible for everything else, <laughs> you know. So, <laughs> so you know, it, it's worked out pretty good. But you know, show business is is really really weird. <laughs> this and, is true. And and when we got we were on Atlantic for seven years. When we got dropped, I was just so relieved because um, maybe that wasn't a good fit. Uh, me and show business, you know, you, you ever hear about Artie Shaw? Yes. He, he quit show business because he thought it was dumb. <laughs> Honestly, you know, and then, <laughs> and then you get to my generation and it's like, like dumb things like, like there's a show, you know, and at the end, they're going to get everybody on stage, like five guitar players to play Louie Louie, you know, that's sort of like, just a little emblematic thing of show business. I'm not complaining, but sure you are. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm really not. But no, I'm just kidding. I had the most fun. The most fun I had in the early days was being in a local band that was hot. And a local band will only stay hot for three years at the most. You know, it's like the life of G Jesus's career only lasted three years, and and the clubby new shoes, like we were. <laughs> Longer, but the really good patch was about two and a half years at the beginning, you know, and that was really super fun to have anybody like you for the first time, you know, and the, the, the record label thing that was more about uh, big singles. And uh, honestly, that's too dumb to realize that, you know, I just wanted to be, I don't know what I want to be, but uh but I certainly wasn't uh, <laughs> thinking of of. Um, you wanted to create new stuff all the time. Yeah, was, I, yes. When when we were on tour, I was like, "What? We can't make up something back." No, because the audience only wants to hear what's on the record, you know. And I I just thought that was boring. And um, which makes right. sense that that's what they'd want to hear. I mean, that's what I want to hear is. when now, I go. Now I understand show business. You know, you heard Paul McCartney like he didn't play Beatles tunes on tour for a long time, and then he went, "Well, I, I guess this is what people want to hear, so we'll start playing them." <laughs> <laughs> so you know, you, know, does, you know, they want to hear "Hey Jude," and your mother should know. Um, yeah. So anyway, I, I figured out show business after we were not in it anymore. <laughs> It was oh my kind of, goodness. Kind of funny because we were just jazz people, man. You know, it came into it with that sensibility. I didn't know what a Grammy was when we got the call for that. You know, that that's how like we were just like, you know, I'm just walking around thinking about uh George Russell's Lydian chromatic theory, you know, and stuff like that. 
Uh, so, so you know, the whole thing was a big surprise, and it was it was nice. We got to see a bunch of the world, and we get to be artists still because of the success of of that. The well, mental health question. aspect, though, continues oh, yeah. to be something I didn't that's... answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> just like the political Sorry. debate last Sorry. night. Um, no. <laughs> anyway, the, but the, the mental health piece is has always been a part of it because music, when you make music and people love it, that's a heady feeling. You know, Indeed. and it's it's a conversation that you actually most, you know, most artists anyway, want to have a conversation with an audience of some kind, whether it's, you know, live on the radio, whatever, just to know that their work is being seen by people who appreciate it. And um, and it's also a really heady thing. And I guess by heady, I mean, it's uh, it gives your brain and you're you, a, a lot of dopamine you get a lot of pleasure from playing music when it goes right you know Indeed. and there's nothing like it in the world it's actually takes up it's it lights up the same area as the of the brain as chocolate sex drugs and sex <laughs> drugs and chocolate basically <laughs> certain foods sax and drums and rock and roll yeah right <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, people who, um, people who don't, who also base their identity around who they are as a musician, um, and when it, so when it doesn't, or whatever you do that you base your identity on, and if it doesn't go well, and you're not, you don't have resilience built in to your, to your, to your system, it's really tough. And so I think that's why so many musicians do go off the rails because mm. when they stop being able to play for maybe they had a hit record and they stop being able to play for large audiences, they, you know, you miss that on a real visceral level. It's like, um, you know, going into withdrawal from a you drug can, that you, you love. You get really depressed about that yep. if you're, you know, if that's your whole life. So that I think it's really important to build resiliency um, into the mix. And you, it's harder for people who've had trauma in their early lives to do that, but it's not impossible um, to be able to um, build resiliency through, you know, good sleep, you know, body, uh, body stuff, sleep, good food, gut health, <laughs> um, all Being of that interested stuff. interested in other stuff. Um, then the mental aspects of, yeah, being interested in, in other stuff. And then the relational aspect, too, where you have your people who you know love you for who you are. Not in, in spite of your foibles, but because of them, you know. And so uh, I think that's how you, you kind of weather those ups and downs um, in, 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 of the mental health piece. And right. it's it's harder when you're younger, I think, because you don't know yourself as well. And right. I know I was a very, um, you know, uh, in spite of all my bluster, uh, or you know, I'd tell myself these things don't matter. And I know it's important to just know who I am and not depend on other people for my sense of self worth. I still did, you know. And that's the other thing about being this age. I I I feel like I'm not as dependent on that as I was. Right. I, I, one of the reasons, main reasons why I wanted to bring that question to both of your attentions is because, uh, when I look at singers like Janis Joplin and Amy Winehouse, mm -hmm. very talented, but what I've seen from them, they, pu they put all of their personal experiences in their music. And there was no cutoff point where you had somebody that was going to be there and be really, truly supportive of them and you mm -hmm. see that from so many artists and i wanted to ask you valerie since you are a vocal teacher and you're an exceptional vocalist when you have artists young inspiring artists come to you and they want to get in this business how do you convey to them to be prepared for the different pitfalls because a lot of us we become enamored with the fame but we don't understand the price that you pay, there's a price that you pay to if you want to live this particular kind of lifestyle in this industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. 
and it's different for uh, the answer is a little bit different for every singer, of course. Um, but the main things are just basically what I talked about just now is um, being aware of, you know, why you're doing music in the first place. And uh, I usually, I, in the 20 years that I taught voice, I would try to talk singers out of doing it, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, as a vocation. Uh, okay. Because I think, you know, there's always, there are always the people out there who really, that is the only thing that they want to do with their lives. And there's nothing else that gives them that same joy. And they should definitely pursue, you know, that dream. But I would also talk about really seeing, um, measuring yourself in terms of uh, musicianship and, and, and vocal expertise um, using an inner and an outer measuring stick. So the world out there is going to always measure you in a certain kind of way, knowing, you know, what kind of styles of music are happening and all that. That's, that's important to know so that you can know how you measure up against those styles of music, if that's the style you want to do. But the inner measuring stick is the one that's like, I'm okay, just as I am. I, I want to get better as a musician and as an artist and a performer, but I, I'm not going to be dependent on on those accolades to make me feel like I'm worthy, you know. So those are the things that I used to talk about with with students who I knew were like, this is what they have to do. Just a hypothetical question for both of you. If you had a major label approach you today and they said, you know, we want to sign you to a contract, hmm. want you to perform what would it take for that to happen? Oh, man. To perform what? To perform what? You just the, have the freedom to perform whatever you want to perform. New music, anything. Yeah, but you know what? <laughs> 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 That's, That's a great question. I love this hypothetical. <laughs> really, it's just so hypothetical because... Um, because you know, I, I'm listening to this Beatles podcast, these two guys from Ireland. It's called Nothing Is Real. Okay. And they talked about the idea that if a band lasts for 20 years, then their audience doesn't want new material. They don't. They want to live in the moment when they fell in love with that group. And I think New Shoes reached that point. And we, we had the freedom to do a lot of stuff after that. I mean, we made four or five more records, I don't know, after we got dropped from Atlantic. But, you know, it's just the stuff that was that circles the earth to this day. These songs, there's a Saturn ring around the earth of <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> and point of no return. <laughs> and a, a little minor star for should I say yes? Should, should I say yes? It's like the covers over Africa where it actually was a big hit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Africa, they love should I say yes. Yeah. So honestly, I mean, to your hypothetical, I say there's no audience. And we're certainly capable of generating new ideas. That I have a stops. hypothetical though, darling. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you could make if you could make any record you wanted to make though and then tour it and it didn't matter if there was an audience for it or not but the record company was just like yeah let's just you know give you the money to do these things what would you do would you do it and have you heard you Corey do? wong have you heard of this guy Corey wong no no I haven't. oh the, this is a a, a half Asian, half white funk guy with a big giant horn section, Corey Wong. He's doing what I would do already. So <laughs> I don't know. I think that'd be my answer too. But there are so oh, and, many and incredible the other guy, Jacob musicians. Collier. Oh Jacob yeah. Jacob Collier. Like he's doing what, what we would do. And except we're not ahead. Jacob Collier in right, either right, one of us. Right. No, yeah. no, not even. Yeah. But um but no, I think that there are so many fabulous musicians out there doing it because they are driven to do to do it. And and I think neither of us have have that kind of drive that it takes to even go through the creative process. Never mind what happens, who pays for it and what happens at the end of it. 
It's like the next project always had there was always a next project that was like pulling at either one of us to say we got to do this no matter what you yeah. know no matter what happens and i don't think either of us feel quite like that anymore um though we have other projects that are definitely saying hey me hey me but they're not <laughs> they're not music projects and also like we have this kind of knowledge if if the, we went into a studio we could sure know how to make a record you know because we made seven or eight of them and um you get a hang for it um you know it's, if it was a single with maybe another artist that was like hey do it well, let's do a collaboration here um and it was somebody who we just really 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 wanted to work with i think and we they, might they just want to sample i can't wait Anyway, so <laughs> anyway, so you know, I oh, mean, you're like so that's pessimistic. That's, no, I'm not pessimistic. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to drive it home that there's <laughs> the audience for new shoes is finite in terms of material. We've done everything that I know we were you're gonna, being a realist. Whoops, that we we're sorry. gonna do, and and this segues into the fact that we have always been interested in other stuff too. Like a funny thing that we're interested in now is birds because one of our backup singers uh, got us into birds. She, she was like, she went to Africa on her honeymoon um, to go to bird look at watching. birds. Yeah. Okay. And she's okay. so musical and can hear their songs and know what, you know, about their, about their um, vocal, what kind of birds they are and, and yeah. what, even what sex they are sometimes through their bird calls and all this stuff. It's quite amazing. And so, so it just opened up our world, this world that we didn't even know existed. And now we go outside and it's like, wow, there's so much going. This? Yeah. There's <laughs> so much going on out there in terms of the, the music of the planet. It's just really right. Yeah. Sounds well crazy, said. but it's cool. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I actually thought, that from a creative aspect, I thought, Valerie, I thought for sure that you would do as far as soundtracks were concerned, movie soundtracks, because you definitely have the vocals to do it. And I thought John uh -huh. would be comfortable working behind the scenes as far as arranging movie soundtracks. Do, does any of that kind of somewhat at least pique your interest at all? As far I, did as doing a lot of film, I did a lot of film scoring in the 90s and uh, 2000s. Mm -hmm. um and I, and i really uh, that's what i wanted to do you know uh now i don't have the gear that i had back then so if a thing came in well that, my gimmick though was to hire real people and so w when we lived in portland i had a stable of people from the symphony i could bring in one or two people to make things sound real because it was really frustrating uh dealing with 90s orchestral sounds you know the er early orchestra synthesizer stuff was not you could be there all night and it would never be right you know so i just right. wouldn't heck with it you know um and i would bring in cello players and one or two people to play over the machines yeah i i'm really into film scoring but um I'm 68 now. I'm, I'm going to be 69 in two months. And I feel this shift. I feel this shift of, you know, I didn't really take a break from 1977 to 2017, 2019. And, you know, I'm, I'm just ready to relax now. And that doesn't mean like, like be lazy or anything. It just means like, you know, let's go out. We go to, art museums now we go he hear classical string stuff and you know what i'm saying it's like i just feel like relaxing now and not right. be and not being like on it the whole time <clears throat> i did that it's nice I, to take some time to fill the well fill the yeah. creative well you know you can't always be on output you got to have a little time for input and oh we just we live in a beautiful <laughs> place and we have this amazing life where we get to where we get to experience a lot of different things and who knows what will happen in the future. I mean, yeah. I've learned to never say never. Yeah, that's true. You don't know what's out mm -mm. there, and, but right. thanks for asking, you know, it, it shows yes. that you're, you would like to, you know, 
I would love to. My my only regret, which is I have very few regrets, but my major regret is that I would have loved for Valerie to have the opportunity to work with Claire Fisher and do oh, a jazz album. You know who that is, Val. Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah. I yes. think you two together would have been exceptional working well, thank on it. That's quite an odd. I mean, to have you say that, uh, she's she's an amazing no. singer. Oh my god! No, you know. she's the she's the arranger on arranger. The, she wrote oh, the sorry. string parts on Who all the. Who am I thinking? The, uh, I don't know. Claire, um, parts on Claire a, Fisher, a but you, you know what? It would be nice if she worked with Claire Fisher, but she's got me. <laughs> <laughs> And, I'm look John, that's why I'm looking and honestly, what like I could do pretty much anything. Uh, that's why. That's why I love you, John. That's. Why. <laughs> uh, I am glad. You know, we worked at Paisley Park for a month or two, three weeks or something, mm -hmm. and uh, didn't meet Prince. Met his dad. Didn't meet Claire Fisher, but met Eric Leeds, who was his, oh, okay. His uh, Barry player, who uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, that's you know, I feel like we've gotten to do as much music as any 10 people that you know, you know, and just written thousands of pages of charts and you know, been through. I mean, imagine, but there's probably 70 band members that went through our band, but over years, that's like you know, five or six a year. You know, so we've we've played with 70 New Shoes members and we've seen a bunch of countries and, you know, it's been a really good ride. It has been a really good ride. And we're just I grateful. I just remembered her name, Claire Martin. She's an amazing jazz okay. singer in England. So check okay. her out oh, oh, oh. <laughs> if you get a chance. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's my wish. I wish, you know, somewhere down the line that you would make a jazz album. I know wow. it would be incredible you have the vocals to pull it off but you know i'm a little bit selfish and that's okay and i think what it is for a lot, a lot of us sweet. it's like linus's blanket we get comfortable <laughs> we want something <laughs> that we become so accustomed to and used to which i find it ironic what you said something earlier john that i seen this interview given by rem and the entire group they said so what would it take to bring you guys back out of retirement and perform and they said nothing. He said, we won't do it. He said, we've already left our body of work. And he said, we don't feel the need that we can come back and give our loyal listeners anything new. Yeah. We're done. Hall and Oates, Hall and Oates did that too. They, they yeah. said, we, we're going to go out on top. Mm -hmm. You know? And, yeah. Uh, it's a good way to go because uh, you don't want to just phone it in. You know? No. I mean, it has to feel for for us. It has to come from a genuine place because it also takes a lot of energy. So if it's not genuine, it's soul sucking. <laughs> Just to tell you the truth, I mean, you know, Valerie made a big band record. No, and, no, yeah, and we were trying to get your uh, yes. snail mail address to send you. Um, Send you a bunch of CDs. Yeah, so yes, give us please. your mail. So, yeah, if you want a jazz record, address, we already guys. did it. <laughs> and oh, I also yeah, did a, okay. a jazz record with um, a wonderful keyboardist, uh, Tom Grant. I don't know if you remember him from the 80s either. He had some Smooth hits. Smooth jazz guy. Smooth jazz hits. And we did a duet record of some beautiful um, compositions, uh, some jazz, some pop that – that was just the two of us, piano and voice. So I think you might like that. So I, I did it. I know I will love it without question, but you know, I have something very special for the for the listeners who are watching live and for those who've shown up late, shame on you. But the teddy bear <laughs> does forgive you. <laughs> We're being joined by two incredibly gifted, talented artists, of course, Valerie Day and Mr. John Joe Cool Smith is joining us today <laughs> <laughs> from New Shoes. And of course, I have this very captivating young lady right here singing lead vocals to this wonderful skull. So let's get into it with Drifting here on Night Tracks Radio.
<laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> Just yeah. as smooth as a baby's touch, Valerie Day. And the arrangement was incredible. My love, your vocals are incredible and they're timeless. Thank you so much for blessing us with so much great music. And Joe Cool, man, you're an incredible arranger. I know you don't need anyone to tell you that because you uh -huh. already know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have confidence. I got I to gotta say that track, though, um, that, uh, I think I was more responsible for the vocal arrangement. The track is pure Jeff Lorber. Really? Yeah, he. you know who that is, right? And Yes, I've had him on my show. I've interviewed him. He's a great dude. He, he yeah, is he guy. is, and he's still a friend of ours. Um, and and that was I'm listening to that track is just like hearing all these Lorberisms <laughs> in it, you know, yeah, different For patches real. that he did, you know, um, and and he he was a really great guy to learn from. I love the backup singers on that record too. Do um, you know who it was? I was who sang that. Was that I, the Minnesota people? I think it was the the Steele family. Yeah, yeah. Uh, J, JD Steele and, and Javita Steele. And Javita who, Steele. Who was, Have you heard of them? Tim? Yeah, the Steeles out of Minnesota. Yes. Yes, yes sir. Yes, yes. yes. I think that's yes. who those. She yes. was um, on Prairie family. Home Companion for a while. She was a regular. Javita was. Yeah. Anyway, amazing. Velveeta and, uh, Steel. I used to call her. <laughs> <laughs> so smooth. Right. Yeah. So when I Just when like, I hear that, that's why you have so many loyal, I like to use the term fans because it sounds so generic. You have so many loyal supporters who love you guys' music. Who love you. And we're and so we, grateful for them. Yes, really. we are. <laughs> yeah, we are. Yeah. It's been well, a great family. ride, man. <laughs> <laughs> to get all the latest updates, let your fingers do the walking. Stop by the official website, of course, of New Shoes. That's at newshoesmusic.com. And be sure when you get there, you get all the latest updates and send a cornucopia of emails. So hopefully you can say, please, 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 we need some music. We need another live performance. Hint, hint, hint. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> don't listen to the to teddy the man behind the curtain <laughs> we can get we can get joe cool and get john in that frame of mind so you know what it's like the blues brothers we're getting the band back together <laughs> <laughs> no man you know uh new shoes recorded about 60 official songs for releases and so we're just going to feed them all into AI and have them average them out and spit out, <laughs> spit out a new, new record. <laughs> and it'll be I'm dying to hear that. <laughs> right? Lord. Oh, my goodness. That is too cute. Family, and I do consider you family. Whatever you need, please do not hesitate to let me know. I love both of you. And more importantly, I respect everything that you've done and accomplished. I'm happy that you're in a particular time of your life where you're at peace with one another. Hey, we both yeah, 21. Man. We done been there. <laughs> We've been there and done that. And I can say I'm at peace, but I keep striving. I just, I have this urge to sit up and just bring real music back to their ways. Right on. Right. I have, I have good, to do that. I yeah, have to, because it's just too many great artists like yourselves and yeah. everything now, as far as music has become so generic. Uh, it's turned into tabloid radio. It's not about the artists. It's not about the stories tabloid behind the music. Radio. It's not about the stories behind the music, ah. the creative aspect. None of that exists anymore. So I've seen the need. I'm here to fulfill it. I'm like Calgon, Valerie. I'm here to take everyone away. Yes, Lord. <laughs> I love it. That's <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> we appreciate you, Teddy. Thanks again yeah, for man. having us on the show. My pleasure. Again, family, to get all the latest updates, be sure to stop by their official website. That's at www.newshoesmusic.com. God bless my queen, Squire, Joe hey, Coop, yeah. John. Thank you <laughs> yeah, so much, man. my man. <laughs> hey, don't forget, uh, give us your mailing address. I will definitely do that. I'll make that happen ASAP because I want some music. I want some autograph music, please. We'll, we'll send you that <laughs> jazz record so we don't have to make another one. <laughs> All right, brother. Thank All right, you man. so Peace. much. Take care. Peace. <laughs> right. The legendary new shoes, John. John. 
And Valerie from New Shoes, thank you so much for joining us today. Lord have mercy, we got to love it. I want to thank everyone for tuning in and allowing the teddy bear to help you tune out all the negative energy. We're not trying to vibe that way. It's all love. And for those who missed the interview, no need to fear. We got you covered. Be sure to stop by our official YouTube channel. That's at youtube.com forward slash night tracks with two X's. That's night tracks radio podcast. Also, we're streaming live on iHeartRadio. You can catch us on iHeartRadio as well as Spotify with the same handles. And also be sure to follow us on Facebook Live or just Facebook in general. Also, the artist formerly known as Twitter. We're also on X. And last but not least, follow us on Instagram and also on TikTok. That's at Night Tracks Radio. We'll be back on there live actually on July the 2nd with the legendary Mr. Lou, Blue Lou <laughs> Marini, of course, from the legendary Blues Brothers will be joining us. And that'll be July the 2nd at about what I believe that I want to make sure I have everything correct. It'll be 12 p.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern. He has a new double CD. Yes, Lord, the teddy bear had his couple of hands on it. And it'll be available actually out in October. So we can't wait to have him on the show and to get all the updates and make sure you tuned in. Make sure to get all and link up with us. We appreciate you. Without love, we have nothing. So I bring this love and I bring honesty to you. And as in always, well, here on Night Tracks Radio, have a fantastic Fantastic, fantastic weekend. <laughs> Lord, ever <have> say. <mercy. laughs>